so we asked um, a local guy, Evan Snow, to come today and just share a little bit with us about what he does and uh, kind of the journey he's been on as a, an entrepreneur. Um, so Evan, I'm probably not going to get everything you do here because he does a lot. <laughs> so as a lot of you know, as an entrepreneur, you usually have ideas popping up all over the place and they don't stop and you're like, oh, maybe we could do this or maybe we could do that. And, and that just is a natural thing, but I'm going to read a little bit of his bio so, <laughs> so I don't get anything wrong. So, so Evan's a local arts advocate, community builder, creative entrepreneur, and one of the prouder, proudest Broward County natives you'll ever meet. Um, the pride has led him to furthering the Choose 954 social movement he just created a few years ago to cultivate culture and community in his native Broward County. Snow has worked diligently to create initiatives in our community to highlight the local creatives he's built relationships with over the years that deserve a platform to be showcased. These initiatives have included Art Fort Lauderdale, the Art Fair on the Water, Fort Lauderdale Art and Design Week, the Choose 954 Local Artist Discovery Series, AAF Creative Zen, and Zero Empty Spaces, among others. Throughout his journey of advocating for art, he's found time to be the founding board member of the Ocean Rescue Alliance and 1000 Mermaids Artificial Reef Project, working to deploy artistically crafted artificial reefs in the oceans off the coast of South Florida. This has since led to the creation of two, and probably more now, artificial reefs um, in our area, with 100 structures being deployed to help provide habitat for fish, aid in coral restoration, support ecotourism, and countless other benefits to reefs. Um, so I'm, I'm going to stop there, but basically, Evan's done a lot of stuff. So he, um, the one thing I really love and I think is very similar is he saw a need for artists in South Florida, and he was able, through partnerships and strategically working with people, to um, provide space for these artists. So all of us know looking for space, South Florida is really expensive. And as an artist, it's really difficult. And he's been able to find a way around that to provide space. But he didn't just stop there. He started doing all these art shows and all kinds of different things. And he's, he's made a huge impact in South Florida. I've been to several of their art openings. We've been blessed to have a thousand mermaids come to our class and talk to us. Um, he's done a lot of great things. And I, I hear somebody just said that to me, how do I do everything I do all the time? And do I sleep? And I actually, I actually sleep really well because I'm so exhausted. <laughs> but um, but I, I think that about Evan. I'm like, how does he do all this stuff? And, and where does he find the time? So he's going to share a little bit about his story and what he's done. And, um, and he's been kind of where I feel this week, where you know you get really just are burnt out, and you're like, how many am I going to keep on going? So I think it's just really important. His story is very similar to all of ours. So I'm really excited to hear from him. And this is Evan. We have plenty of visual representation on YouTube and social media. If you guys want to see videos to what I'm referring to, but thankfully we have some images here. Um, so I can get a better understanding of. Uh, where you guys are coming from. How many of you live here in Broward County? All right. How many of you have kids? Okay. And uh, how many of you have heard of any of the things that she just mentioned? Okay, very good. I don't take offense if you have <laughs> So um, my name is Evan Snow, and I am a very proud arts advocate, community builder, and creative entrepreneur, born and raised here in Broward County. I'm gonna give you guys a different version of the story than I normally tell, because I feel this is a very important audience to share this version of the story about my childhood, how it wasn't a straight and narrow path, and how it did lead me to becoming the human being that I became today to do the work that I do in the community and the world. So, <clears throat> uh, my parents, I, I like to give them credit, give you guys some context, they met through something called Landmark Education, Landmark Form, Anybody ever heard of S training? So they actually worked with uh, Warner Earhart, the founder, and it was kind of like predated gratitude training. It's like a self-help, you know, seminar series. Uh, they graduated all the way up to the advanced course and helping people and volunteer. It was a lot of volunteering, and um, you know, hosting seminars and workshops and so on and so forth. And I like to feel it's worth mentioning that those genes were intrinsically passed down into my DNA 
that gave me some altruistic desire that was very deep inside of me and a lot of things you'll come to find out were very deep inside of me that I had to make a series of choices to step outside of my comfort zone to unlock my hidden potential that I'm that cannot help but be transparent. This was not taught to me in the school system, obviously. You know, and we'll get there. The other thing, I, I'm an advocate. You, when I say advocacy, and she mentioned arts advocacy, do you guys, does anybody have any questions about that? Is that transparent? Do you understand why it's important to advocate for art, or for the community, or for the reefs? You know, these are things that need a voice, need support, but the reefs, in this instance, they're out of sight, out of sight, out of mind for so many people. The majority of people that don't dive, I don't even dive, will never understand or appreciate the value of the reefs to our ecosystem, to our environment, to our economy, so many things. So I found a calling to be the voice for sometimes resources and people that are not that they're voiceless, but that they deserve to be advocated for. And once again, this is not a straight and arrow, uh, straight the straight and straight and arrow path to doing the work that I'm doing, to finding the fulfillment in life that I'm finding, and impacting lives the way that I'm impacting them. The other thing that I feel is worth mentioning: my father grew up playing the game of lacrosse. How many of you are familiar with the game of lacrosse? How many of you grew up in Long Island or Maryland? Interesting, okay. Um, how many of you didn't know about the game of lacrosse five, 10, 20 years ago? Okay, the game of lacrosse when I was growing up, um, it, was a private, it was a private school sport, it was a club sport. I used to play against St. Andrews, Pinecrest, and all the private schools. My father grew up playing the game in Long Island where the game is very prevalent. It is the national sport of, of Canada, it's not hockey. It's a very popular sport globally, but it wasn't here in America. And my father, my godfather, a lot of passionate volunteers advocated for the game, going to school board meetings, going to state meetings, going to national meetings, to the point that the year after I graduated, it became an FHSAA public school sport. And now the sport is in all public schools, and it's one of the fastest growing games in the world. It's a very popular game. So I like to mention that in situations like this because watching my father advocate for the game and doing things he didn't have to do and stepping outside of his comfort zone truly impacted not only my life, but many other kids' lives and now many other communities. So just wanted to give you that context. So fast forward, um, my parents met, my mother was living in Kendall, which is South Miami, my father was living in North Miami, and they met without cell phone, internet, or GPS because they met through Landmark. And fortunately, they connected, they decided they wanted to move to Broward County, one of the best decisions of my life. And uh, they landed in Coral Springs, which as I'm sure you guys know, is a very nice suburban, blue collar, or white collar town. Um, a lot of parks, a lot of great schools, a lot of great things to do for a kid. So I had a great childhood growing up, I played sports, I tumbled, mommy and me, you know, all those things. Um, and then, fourth and fifth grade came around. And I started speaking out. And I started saying a lot of things that all of the other kids were thinking and didn't want to say because they didn't want to get in trouble. And then in fifth grade, I had a great teacher at Park Springs Elementary. And um, you know, the fifth grade trip was coming around to Washington, DC. And I wasn't able to go because I got in trouble. And my little brain at that time couldn't really process what was really happening and the, the lifelong effects that would take place as a result of speaking up and saying things that I thought I was supposed to say that everybody wanted to say, but nobody else wanted to say them because they didn't want to get in trouble. But that ultimately paved the way for me to find my true voice, my true calling later in life. I'm, you know, once again, super transparent. I spent a lot of time in middle school in internal, external suspension, and detention. How many of your kids have spent time in one of those places? Okay, I, I'm truly here to remind you that there is a brighter path ahead. I know I don't have kids. I'm single, never married, no kids. That's part of how I'm able to do all the stuff that I'm doing, but there truly is a brighter path ahead. 
because I vividly remember when my and my parents remember more vividly when the assistant principals would call them to pick me up from school, they would always tell my parents, Evan's a great kid. He has all the potential in the world. He just can't seem to figure it out. And in all reality, the school system wasn't for me. How many of you guys are familiar with uh, a gentleman by the name of Gary Vaynerchuk, Gary V? Okay, he's uh, one of the most successful advertising agencies. He's a very famous speaker. He was a very famous investor. He took the first Uber ride. He was one of the first people on Facebook, Airbnb. He preaches now about entrepreneurship and that you know there is a different path in life for kids that maybe not everybody's supposed to go to school to be a lawyer or a doctor. And if you want to be a lawyer or a doctor, obviously you need to go to law school, you need to go to medical school, but there really is no school for entrepreneurship. There really is no school for community building. There really is no school for being an advocate. Um, but once again, if you make a, a series of choices, you can step outside your comfort zone to unlock your potential. So this is um, some things you can go to the next slide. So it's a little bit of my childhood. My parents were great, played lacrosse, as I mentioned. All good. And then, fortunately, I discovered a love for TED Talks. How many of you guys listen to TED Talks? All right. Started listening to them on my lunch break when I was a recruiter in my 20s. Um, started going to TEDx NSU here and heard some phenomenal stories from students, alumni, professors. I'm an ocean conservationist. I felt very fortunate to be here for Dr. Guy Harvey's TED Talk. And um, these TED Talks were providing a, a, a level of inspiration to me that ultimately paved the way for changing my life. So at this time, um, I'm recruiting and I discovered this gentleman I just mentioned by the name of Gary V. And he was preaching at this time, don't do stuff you hate. You know, if you are 30 years old, you can put your head down and grind on a project for three years and if you wake up, you're still 33 years old. And I happened to be 30 years old at that time. So I was working as a recruiter, a headhunter. Do uh, you guys know what that is, staffing? You know, you learn to fit a square peg in a round hole. And it was a great job, and it does help people. And you do place people in jobs so that they can continue earning income and living life. But it was ultimately not rewarding and fulfilling for me. Um, so fortunately, what was rewarding and fulfilling for me at this time was food. And going to cool restaurants, and meeting chefs, and going to these really cool experiences like tastings. And I was exploring a different business at this time, and I met a woman at a training seminar on break who told me she was doing this thing in 2014, it was new, called blogging, where she was getting paid to get free stuff to write about it, and it was very like Rob Report-esque. So it was watches and shoes and cars, and I kind of made a mental bookmark of that. Um, so, I had a friend and mentor who was renting space in a co-working space who told me they're doing a monthly breakfast lecture series, a mini TED talk that's held for free in my space. It's you know something I think's up your alley, you should come. The first one was a gentleman by the name of Brandon Wells, Wells Coffee. Uh, great guy, um, great coffee roaster, legend, local legend, not the best speaker, he's a little dry and boring if you know him, but a phenomenal human being. I said, ah, I don't know about this uh, morning lecture series thing. Let me give it a second shot. The second one was Adam Garfield, who's the founder of Speedy Tab. He was the one that inventing, invented pre-ordering drinks on your phone and sold it to Visa for however many millions of dollars. So I said, okay, there's something here. I kind of like this thing. The third one was this, oh no, I'm a bad. Sorry. The third one was this young lady on the left. Does anybody uh, know Alexa Rose Carlin? She created the Women's Power Expo. Um, it was a big thing in Fort Lauderdale for many years pre-COVID. So she was talking on the, the topic of language, and it wasn't that we speak the language of English, Hebrew, or Spanish. If you speak the language of positivity, you'll portray positivity. And if you speak the language of unworthiness, well, obviously your actions and reactions are gonna be unworthy. But more so than that, very interesting story. She had a bacteria, she was a, she was a rising, promising college student at UF, pursuing her dreams. She got a bacterial infection, developed sepsis, was in a coma, 1% chance of living, saw herself running through the green field of grass, got out of the coma, became a speaker, author, founder of the Women in Power Expo, and at this talk, what really resonated with me was she was preaching to be genuine, be authentic, and pursue your passions. 
And at this time, I'm really loving this food thing. And I had just started, uh, my friends would say, I love the places that Snow Stops had. I go by my last name, I don't really love my first name. So I started Snow Stops Food Blog. And my, uh, fortunately, I, I moved into a place in downtown Fort Lauderdale in 2015 with two brothers from Honduras, by the way, in Memphis. And Memphis, great place, a lot of history, has two of the five worst neighborhoods in the country. Despite that, they were always telling me about this thing called the World Championship Barbecue Festival during a Memphis in May month-long celebration. If anybody, has anybody ever heard of that? All right, that's on your bucket list now. Um, so they invited me to go to Memphis, and in Memphis, I found out about a social movement called Choose 901. I started looking it up, and it started coming up in conversation. They would say, David, my roommate, wouldn't choose 901 because he wouldn't go back home to Memphis. And this was in 2015. Um, social media was not as big as it was then, but this page had 70,000 followers. And I'm like, wow, this is kind of interesting. I call, speak to one of the co-founders. They tell me the church started it to teach community members comp computer skills so they could have better employment opportunities, which I can appreciate as being a recruiter at that time. Then I come to find out the city acquired it to use it as a recruitment tool to recruit teachers, paramedics, and firefighters to want to live and work in Memphis because they have two of these five worst neighbors in the country. So I'm seeing the impact of the social movement. I go and I'm blown away. I come back supercharged, inspired, and I'm going around at this time to um, to the arts districts. I'm I'm really falling in love with the arts. Does, does anybody? Uh, or, are you guys familiar with Wynwood? <laughs> How many of you guys went to Wynwood back in like 2014, 2015, maybe 10 years ago? So it was a little different back then. Um, it's another story for another day. But I was really getting blown away by the arts. I couldn't pass up an opportunity to go to Wynwood. But I had just moved to downtown Fort Lauderdale. I'm from Broward County. And at this time, I discovered we had an arts district in Fort Lauderdale. Um, it's technically called Flagler Village which is the Civic Association. The Arts Districts, there are two. There's Mass District, and there is one called Fat Village. Did anybody ever go to Fat Village? Okay. Yes, it is now Flat Village, but that's another story for another day. But um, essentially, I was falling in love with the arts, and I couldn't get enough of these, this arts. And I really wanted to just show all the people that I grew up with in Coral Springs, 35 minutes to the north and west of me, all this cool stuff that was going on with my cell phone and a hashtag. And I see the impact of this Choose 901 thing and I say, we should have something like this in our community. Because all my friends would say, you go to all the coolest things, you know, but I don't want to go to 10 different websites, The New Times, Venice Magazine, Sun Sentinel, blah, blah, blah. I just want to go to one thing. So before the art walk, um, before the art walk one day, uh, in June of 2016, I start uh, Choose 954 with the hashtag and my cell phone. Literally just a live stream, all the cool stuff that was going on. Had no idea, had no plan, but had an internet, I had a cell phone plan. Um, initially, I started it as a social movement to cultivate culture and community in my native Broward County in an effort to keep people to know with all the great things that are going on to make this a better place to live and not just a better place to vacation, because we live here. So I'm doing this literally one or two months, and uh, an educator, a woman that I met at a morning breakfast lecture series event, invited me to the Tower Club for a TEDx simulcast event, because she knew I loved TED Talks, she loved TED Talks. Um, has anybody ever been to the Tower Club? Are you familiar? Members Only Club used to be a little different now, it's a little bit more open and inclusive. It's at the top of the Regions Bank building, downtown Fort Lauderdale, overlooks all of Broward County. Very interesting place. Uh, but it used to be the Good Old Boys Club, and, and I'll leave it at that. So um, she airs a TED Talk. It was Amanda Palmer on the art of giving. She was a musician and a street performer that just wanted to give her music away. Um, and she ended up selling 1.3 million copies of her album just by giving it away and asking her fans and audience to contribute whatever they could to the arts, the music. Beautiful TED Talk, used to be one of the top 10 most watched, watched TED Talks of all time. So after the TED Talk, we're all moved and fired up and uh, there's an opportunity to network. And some old gray-haired gentleman to the right of me 
uh, said, you know, what do you do? And I had just left recruiting to join Entrepreneurville and pursue Choose 954, which really means, and now I do tell this in the book and in the story, I was driving Uber to make ends meet. I was committed to figuring it out, and I figured driving Uber would give me the freedom and flexibility to go and see and do and do all the things I wanted to go and see and do, and then I could you know, drive, make some money, and you know, figure it out. But fortunately, this old gray hair guy on the right of me really could have cared less what I had to say, and fortunately, there was a very sharply dressed Trinidadian brother with a Dolly mask mustache and a Zara suit who was sitting to my left, and he overheard this conversation and he took an interest and he said, that's kind of interesting, let's meet for coffee here next week. And uh, long story short, he was meet 10 years before me, before social media, but he got burnt out that he didn't have a business partner, uh, so he went back to corporate where he was a marketing executive for the Westfield Corporation, one of the largest mall companies in the world. He was a marketing director for the Broward Mall. And um, on our first meeting, uh, you know, I was a recruiter, so I had interviewed thousands of people thousands of times, you know, tell me about your job history, how this led to that, that led to this. So I told him my job history, it was very brief. You know, I did a little recruiting, I played a little poker, I did a little real estate, um, and now I had this Choose 954 thing. He tells me his story, he came to this country from Trin Trinidad to pursue his American dream, went to art school at Miami uh, International Fine Arts College, which is now Miami School of Art and Design, um, worked for some of the largest advertising agencies, um, he told me he was an artist, but he liked nice things, so he couldn't be a full-time artist, so he did advertising where he could still be creative, which is another path in life as well. So we really started to vibe and click, and on our third meeting, um, we're, we're, very, we're obviously very passionate, we're on the same page about wanting to build a community in Broward County, and we're identifying gaps and voids that are missing. And we realized we never had a big signature event for the arts like Art Basel. Is anybody not familiar with Has anybody never heard of Art Basel? It's okay, that's fine, I'll tell you. Thank you. It's the largest art fair in the world that takes place in Miami the first week of December. It single-handedly, undoubtedly, has contributed to the revitalization and overdevelopment of Miami. It generates over one million tourists every year. It generates one billion dollars into their economy for one week of art. Our county estimates that there's a $460 million economic impact for the year to the arts in Broward County. They're doing a billion dollars in one week, okay? It is the biggest thing in art in the world, and it's right down the street, and we never had anything like that. So, we put on our thinking caps, and we say, we have these kind of unique elements in Fort Lauderdale. There's a Lost Soul Center close to waterways, there's beautiful homes and architecture, we have a water taxi system. Why are we going to do, or why would we do, what everybody else in the world does, doing an art fair in a tent, a convention center, or a hotel? White walls, mazes, got to fight for traffic and parking. So we came up with Art for Lauderdale, the art fair on the water, the first art fair in the world to take place inside of luxury waterfront homes and mansions uh, that were for sale, made only accessible via boat. It's a different way to view and interact with art. Our goal with this, was to put Fort Lauderdale on the art world map as an international destination to view and interact with art, while primarily only exhibiting independent artists not represented by galleries, because all the other art fairs in the world were only catering to galleries. The price point is so large to get into. It's very cost prohibitive. How is any local artist in Mass District or in Flagler Village supposed to ever get an opportunity to get to Art Basel? So, as evidenced by this press, you can see here from Architectural Digest and Forbes and CNN Travel and NPR and PBS, we succeeded in our goal of putting Fort Lauderdale on the art world map as an international destination to view and interact with art. Thank you. Thank you. I'm just taking some water. Thank you. Um, this ran four years up until January 2020. So, obviously, we put it on hold. But, um, on a more positive note, this initiative got us a lot of attention from, the, we got involved with the real estate board. The real estate board got us attention from commercial real estate developers and property managers who would say, hey, could you do art in our commercial space? Oh yeah, by the way, we're not gonna pay you for it. 
And a little part of the story that I left out, that art fair, did anybody think that that was a bad idea or a concept? No? Okay. Um, it wasn't. Uh, but we would have thought if we would have started a revolutionary concept to revolutionize the art fair world, the city would want to get involved, the county would want to get involved, the business community would want to get involved, because generally these events are underwritten and sponsored by sponsorships. Well, if we would have waited for a check to come, we would probably still be waiting. So fortunately, my business partner had the foresight and the ability to open his piggy bank in 401k to the tune of about $50,000 to self-fund the art fair to get it off the ground because somebody had to pay to charter the boats and the marketing and all the things. So that's part of the transparency of the story that you know it's not always going to be easy. You should not be self-funding art fairs. You should not be self-funding a lot of creative initiatives. Um, but he knew if we were going to wait, we might be waiting forever. So we did that, and that helped launch ultimately my life's work now. So we were leaving a meeting in Barrett County one day. All these artists would come to us and say, "Hey, where are our studios at? Let alone affordable." Um, at this time, Broward County, that day, an article came out in 2019 that said this was unfortunately one of the least affordable counties for housing. We left the meeting looking at all these four lease signs and said, what if we can make this one of the most affordable places for artists to create at? There's all this empty space. And before COVID, there was 90 million square feet of vacant commercial real estate in this country. And this is gonna actually tie into something we discussed yesterday with vacant schools. But, um, you can see this empty storefront. Um, so we put on our thinking cap again, and we said, what if we can activate these vacant spaces to make affordable art studios? We reached out to a friend of the program, Dean Trantellis, the mayor of Fort Lario, one of the first openly gay mayors of any major city, supported the arts, great guy, um, and said, hey, Dean, you know, we want to do this. And he said, why don't you contact Mike Wayman? the owner of the Los Olds Company. I always heard he was a tough cookie. He was a tough cookie. He gave us a meeting, it took him three minutes. In 2019, Los Olds were not doing so well. There was 19 vacancies. Every third door was closed. It was 86 bucks a square foot to rent. No artist is gonna pay $30,000 a month to have space on Los Olds, let alone studio, not even a gallery. But um, we, he gave us a space that was vacant for three years. We're going there, we're in there for, have one of the widest attended grand openings of anything in Fort Lauderdale history, over a thousand people in the streets. Gets on NPR, gets on you know, PBS, New Times, a lot of press, and um, fortunately the concept was proven. This concept is countless success stories. We've now opened 29 of them over the last four years. We're in three states. We've had over 400 artists come through the program. It's changed hundreds of artists' lives thousands of times over by putting emerging, mid-career, and established artists in a space together where they could be discovered by the public. They could be collected. They can host nonprofit fundraiser events. They can host workshops. They can host classes. And this is not in their house, and this is not in an industrial warehouse district. This is on Las Olas. This is in a former Burberry store next to Louis Vuitton in the Natick Mall. And this is in some really great spaces. So, you know, once again, the school system, <laughs> what the book said to do, never would have said to do this. But, you know, I ultimately stepped outside my comfort zone, made a few choices, um, and a series of choices that led me to doing this work, which is arguably one of the most rewarding and fulfilling things that I could do as an arts advocate, that when I set out, to just start exploring more art, having more art in our community, and covering the arts with my cell phone and a hashtag and a social media page, I never would have imagined that we'd be, you know, helping artists get on the cover of magazines, get collected by museums, and changing artists' lives to support them in being full time and pursuing their passion. But how are we doing on time? Good. Okay. Thank you. So I'll. I'll Wind it down here. So in the midst of this, some artists come to me with some idea. I don't want to manage artists. Um, and they say, we want to put sculptures on top of rocks and put them in the ocean and call them artificial reefs. Oh yeah, we want to do them in the form of mermaids. I had no idea what that meant. They showed me a documentary called Chasing Corals. Anybody ever heard of that? Okay. 
you haven't, that's your homework, go watch that. It was made by the same folks that made Seaspiracy, which received a lot of fanfare. And it alerted me to the issues that were plaguing and affecting our coral reefs, our oceans, our way of life here in Southeast Florida. All they wanted to do was make the art. Somebody had to do the nonprofit. Somebody had to do the marketing. Somebody had to do the events. Somebody had to do the paperwork. And I really felt called at this time. I was, I was trying to discover myself and develop myself in the world and in the community that I was called to do this work. So long story short, <laughs> We start two nonprofits. We put 105 of these in the ocean. Um, we've invented dozens or innovated dozens of um, coral outplanting patents and innovations that the government's using now to scale coral restoration, which I won't tell you about how bad it is for the oceans right now. I'm sure you see it in the news. But fortunately, there's a fight, and we like to think art is a problem solver to address the issues affecting our coral reefs. If nothing else, they raise awareness because they're out of sight, out of sight, out of mind. Mind you, I'm still not a marine biologist, and I'm still not a diver. And nobody has ever asked me to see my marine biology degree. <laughs> Nobody's ever asked me to see my degree. And mind you, not my proudest accomplishment in life. High school, senior year, last semester, I wasn't a great student. Go to the guidance counselor's office, and they say, hey, you're going to be one credit short. Oh yeah, by the way, we're not offering summer school this year. You're going to have to come back for a fifth year of high school. I was walking out the door, and Mr. Muir, another guidance counselor who I played basketball with his son, told me, you know what? Go get a GED. You're going to be all right. College, I get all my credits except for the two math classes. I did pre-algebra. I was doing the workshops. I was trying. I couldn't wrap my head around things I knew I wasn't going to use in the supermarket. Have you guys ever felt that with math with your kids? I mean, I'm an adult now. I've never had to use any of that math anytime, anywhere, for anything. So I am, I could tell you I'm a college and high school dropout. It's not something that I'm like bragging about, but I once again, I'm reiterating this to you guys and the work that you're doing as it relates to your kids and your communities to let you know that there is a brighter and better way. But needless to say, as I wrap up here, I was burning myself out. And uh, fortunately, I, I go to Tulum, Mexico with my nonprofit to do some work. We're working on some reef projects down there. I wake up one morning, I developed a new hobby of taking time-lapse videos and drone videos of the sunrise because I needed more things to do, right? <laughs> and um, we shoot all that. Um, my nonprofit partner goes and walks off to explore the ruins. I was there with some kid that was 10 years younger than me, her friend, she brought him the trip, never met him before, super nice kid. And he turns to me on the beach in Tulum, says the words that changed my life. He says, you wanna do some yoga? And I say, sure. And I had tried a couple times, it wasn't for me, but all we did was a couple down dogs, a couple sun salutations, and I just remember instantly feeling better. And um, you know, I was really burning myself out. This was in November 2020 during COVID. We all, you know, I mean, a lot of people went into COVID saying, I'm gonna come out of this a better version of how I went into it. And I did as well. I got the exercise bands. I tried on my you know, balcony in my apartment. That wasn't for me. But um, fortunately, I had just moved into a beautiful brand new building in downtown Fort Lauderdale, Society of Las Solas, with a 25th floor green space, 180 degree panorama wraparound view of all of Broward County. And I saw a woman who worked in Mass District, who I had known from years ago, who was a yoga teacher, that somehow the universe placed this beautiful soul into the building to offer a free yoga class. So while I'm in Tulum, I drop her a message. There is some other woman that I had just met in my apartment building. Um, who was an attractive personal trainer that I saw was going to yoga. And um, I took a liking to her. I sent a message to Chloe, the yoga teacher. And I said, hey, Chloe, could you put in a good word for me with this girl? <laughs> and Chloe says the other word that changed my life, come to yoga. And long story short, the girl evaporated, the yoga stuck. And um, <laughs> one class led to two classes, led to sound bowls, led to Chloe it, uh, has become a beautiful 
friend to me, my teacher, my coach, my guru. Uh, we just came back from uh, one of her retreats in Seraphos, Greece. Um, and yoga and mindfulness has since had a profound impact on my life. So now I've become a self-care and mindfulness advocate. We had a beautiful event here yesterday, our, our monthly breakfast lecture series that I still host and continue to pay forward for free because um, I knew the impact it had on my life, so I want to continue that. Um, we had one of the most knowledgeable speakers about one of the most important mental health resources available that's about to be rescheduled by the FDA. And I know this is going to be a little taboo or maybe stigmatized for some of you. Is anybody aware of the benefits of psilocybin? Okay, good. Magic mushrooms, psychedelics. The woman works for Third Wave. She's the director of provider relations. She's got 10 degrees. She went to Columbia. We'll post the recording. It's phenomenal. There is a lot of help for mental health in this renaissance of self-care coming, but I've since become a self-care advocate. I outline some of my choices and best practices and protocols and recommendations and things that work for me in my book that I just released called Learning to Choose. Not just my story, but learning lessons that I've acquired along the way um, that have led me unlock my hidden potential. And I'd like to think, if I was truly just a regular guy, a Johnny 9 to 5 recruiter, who was able to listen to some TED Talks and go to Winwood and start a social movement with a hashtag and a cell phone, I never would have ever been able to imagine that we'd be sitting here today and I'd be speaking to an education event, and to educators and to homeschoolers at a place where my business partner is the president of the board of this place now, you know, which is why we do our event here to support, you know, the Alvin Sherman Library and the Quintilla Gallery. If you would have told me that seven years ago, could never have believed it. So I'm glad to share this story, and I was really glad when you guys invited me to share this story because I know it must be tough to have kids. I know I was a tough kid. I'm working very hard now to make my parents proud. <laughs> Very, very hard, and they are very proud. And I'm just gonna, if I just have two more minutes, I'm gonna read just one little snippet from, I started the, chap, I started the book with the chapter about how I was a bad kid in school. So, do you guys open to hear that? Okay. Did I lose anybody yet? Is this, no, okay, cool. I didn't think so. Um, but basically, I'm not gonna read the whole thing, but just, uh, okay. As I was growing up and entering middle school, I tended to subconsciously do the opposite of what the book said to do. Most notably, as far back as I can remember to fourth grade, my friends and classmates would urge me to speak out in class and say the things everyone was thinking but no one wanted to say because it would earn them a trip to internal or external suspension. Actually, I kind of already told you about that part, so. Um, Okay, while I was learning a lot in the process of trying to find out more about myself the hard way, I was also learning a lot about myself and life. Forced from middle school, while in the middle class suburban Coral Springs, at one point was reported as having a 90% African American student body, with a large majority of those kids being bused in from the neighboring city of Pompano, which at the time had many lower income housing projects and not enough desks for all the students within their city limits. Fortunately, throughout this experience, I was also surrounded by many people from South America and the Caribbean islands, developing friendships with Colombians, Haitians, Puerto Ricans, and many other nationalities in between. I credit these diverse experiences at a young age with helping me to not only look at, to not look at people of color or, or immigration status the same way many other white kids from the suburbs did. This inevitably led the way to me partnering with a Trinidadian native who immigrated to this country in pursuit of his American dream, teaching me more about race than any school book could at the height of our modern day race relations. Around this middle school period of my life, I had started playing lacrosse with the Coral Springs Tomahawks Youth Lacrosse Club before the game blew up in popularity and became an in-school sport. I guess because it wasn't in the school system as a sanctioned sport yet, it was club at the time, and that my parents didn't exactly threaten me with taking the game away from me despite my indiscretions, lacrosse became a safe space for me to escape and be with the boys after long days of school. I look back at an alternative school called, you guys remember with Cross Creek? Yeah. yeah. 
that the counselors mentioned, I don't think they were really threatened of sending me to, along with military boarding schools. And I think to myself, if I didn't have sports, I also enjoyed playing basketball in middle school, that I could have gone down a much darker path. I do want to credit my parents for their patience, love, and bringing me to leading local child psychologists, which ultimately did help me progress to being a functioning member of society. And this part, um, I feel for you guys, and this is the realest part probably in the whole book. Not every kid I grew up with was so fortunate to find these experiences, the bad and the good ones. While I was growing up in the relatively safe confines of Coral Springs, I unfortunately knew more kids who passed away before I turned 18 than I have in my last 18 years between car accidents and Oxycontin overdoses. When I say I'm working hard now to make my parents proud, it's to make up for the years of disappointment I left them with as a child. Thankfully, their loving guidance kept me from delving down different paths I could have fallen victim to that wouldn't have allowed me this opportunity to make them proud today. Though it wasn't always easy, as I can't tell you how many times they must have heard, Evan has all the potential in the world from the assistant principals while picking me up from school after an incident. I still vividly remember hearing them say to my parents, he just can't figure it out. But as we discovered later in life, the school system wasn't for me, though a lot of things weren't for me. Maybe Coral Springs wasn't for me. Maybe Boy Scouts wasn't for me. Maybe being an 80s baby wasn't for me. Maybe I was born ahead of my time. But this was the hand I was dealt, and it's not about the hand you're dealt in life, it's how you play your cards. There were a lot of things that weren't for me. The kids I grew up with who didn't end up being lifelong friends weren't for me. I was different. I was an outlier. And I was destined for something bigger, something greater. Over 20 years later, as I found my voice becoming an arts advocate and a community builder, I discovered passions that never knew existed. As I learned when my throat chakra opened, those experiences truly did pave the way for my voice to be heard in more impactful ways than what the book said or ever could have said back then. The book unfortunately did not say to try and support the arts in a place where people really didn't care about the visual arts to the extent that they could have or should have in Fort Lauderdale, Broward County. The book would not have said to do all these things altruistically at your own expense and time when in all actuality, they might not ever pay back, pay, uh, provide a payback or return on investment. That's why I'm writing this book, to hopefully touch and inspire one life, your life, your kid's life, or that kid's life you want to impact because you know they're destined for greatness. I'm 37 years old now, and I always knew I was capable and destined for something more. I never knew how great or what greatness would become, but here are a few things we've accomplished in the first seven years of my art community building career beyond what I could have ever imagined in my wildest dreams. I already outlined them, so I appreciate you guys listening. Certainly glad to answer any questions or talk more offline. Um, and I do have books if you're interested. Um, and I, just in closing, still a regular guy that just got insanely passionate about pursuing my passions and wanting to make my community a better place to live and not just a better place to vacation. If I could do it, anybody could do it. And that's a true story. So yeah, as I listen to Evan, I, I want to ask like, how many of us do what we do because we have a kid like Evan or we experience a kid like Evan? I think like every one of us, right? So, um, so yeah, and I, I think that um, I just really love his story. And then also the fact that, you know, he's, he's going nonstop. He was just telling me he might let a couple things go just for his own well-being. And I think a lot of us are doing that as well. And um, just him learning to be able to take time and take care of himself as well, I think that's really important. But I think, you know, Evan, what he needed in school was more options like everybody here is making for kids, and he's doing something different. And I really think his story of what he did with the arts is what we're all doing at, you know, to be advocates for education, advocates for something different for for the, the kids for school and to be able to learn. So, um, you know, how many of us struggle with the cost of space for a place to educate? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's there, and we're in South Florida. 
Um, there's, there's so much of his story that really coincides with everything that we're doing. So, um, and then also, you know, I just, I told him a little bit of my background, but I went to school for ocean engineering, hence I love, you know, all the ocean stuff he does, but I left school with, had like two credits left to leave. I, I did get my, my bachelor's, but not with everything I needed for the ocean engineering degree. And I opened an art gallery. He <laughs> came home, moved back to South Florida, and opened an art gallery to sell local art. So there's a lot of his story that's very similar to mine. Um, grew, I grew up in Coconut Creek, down the street from Coral Springs. And, um, and then South Florida's really been a big thing for me for community and um, bringing community together, which is why we do this, is to really just bring the community of people changing education in South Florida together. And so I just really value what he's done. So, uh, so that's why I wanted him to speak today. But I would love it. Does anybody have any questions? Actually, one quick caveat on the ocean side. Um, I just want to. I'm gonna. This is like a. It's not a call to action, but this is a um, an opportunity for inspiration for you guys. Um, on the coral side, we developed a patented innovation of a core lock, a threaded receiver screw plug that allows super corals, microfragmented corals, these, these corals of opportunities, this breakthrough in the fight to save the reefs, that we're able to put them on a puck in a lab with permits and protection with the government and, and NSU and, and all the, everybody involved, and literally just screw them onto the base of the reefs that we put out. Because now, when they want to put these super corals out in the ocean, they generally have to use a nail, a zip, which is metal, a zip tie, which is plastic, and epoxy, which is glue. And that's like the best thing they came up with. Then they came up with this coral tree, PVC pipe, still plastic. So we innovated all that, eliminated all that, and basically developed a solution to outplant more corals faster, easier, with safer materials than ever before. Now, there's more corals growing in labs, in tanks, then there are, then there's air in divers tanks to deploy them. And unfortunately, there are more people that went to school for marine biology that don't work in their field than do work in the field. I'm not gonna tell you that NSU pumps out more marine biology degrees than they know they have jobs for, but people wanna be marine biologists and I support them in that. What we came up with, with a friend of Tony's, um, that works with the Urban Farming Institute, we created a Coral Rangers program. And the Coral Rangers program initially started working with New River Middle, which is a magnet school for marine education, to take kids that are interested in diving in the ocean, support them in getting certified in diving, so they could be, I don't know if you guys have ever heard of the term citizen scientists, but they could help us outplant coral because there is so much coral that needs to be outplanted. So our goal and our thought, and it's, it's, it's probably not gonna come to reality unless somebody funds it, and we've never really gotten major funding, so I'm not here to cry about that. But we're basically, the takeaway, the thought, the inspiration, the motivation is we're trying to create the next wave of coral gardeners and coral farmers because not every kid is gonna, some kids go to trade school, some kids go to vocational school. So what if all these kids want to do is dive and save the reefs and now plant coral? And what if we can get them 50, 60, 70 thousand dollars a year to pursue their passion and be a coral gardener and a coral farmer? And I'm, thank you. And I'm sorry that the government doesn't feel that that's important right now as the corals die, but that's basically, if that's something that we can innovate and develop within our vertical and our medium, think about ways that you could develop new opportunities to support your interests and the kids that you mentor, and maybe they just wanna farm and be an urban farmer, not a coral farmer, because farming is important too. So I just like to mention that one, but I will be glad to answer any questions, please. Good morning, good morning. Thank you so much for sharing your story. It's very inspirational, I appreciate that. I just had a quick question. When you said the mayor gave you space, the mayor, as the mayor um, suggested, that he did not, and he okay. still hasn't, so thank you for clarifying. Uh, he's a great guy, nothing bad to say about Dean, but he said we should connect with um, Mike Weymouth, the owner of Los Olas Company, who at the time had a lot of vacancy, and we pitched this concept 
as a vacancy management strategy and solution that will have the space open and active daily. We'll do the marketing, the signage, the grand opening, the press, the social media, and it's an activation. So it was a win. We created a win-win-win to the point that he gave us this kind of space that worked out for everybody, and then we rented it back out to artists. So the artists could have the opportunity of a lifetime to be in a retail setting on Las Olas, and they all had a lot of success. Wonderful. Thank Thanks. you so much. For that. Thank you. Does anybody else have a question? Thank you. I'm sitting right here, but I have a small voice, so probably need it. Um, just, I'm curious about the because um, I've been thinking about reefs too, and I know about the Mermaids through the tunnel. Um, but I feel like we, what would really help us would be reefs that are close to the shore. Because right now, most of the reefs, you have to have a boat. You have to go out to the reef to see it, whether you're in the Keys, or the Keys Cane, or even some of the reefs here. There are very few reefs that you can get to from the shore. And that would be much more accessible. And so I'm just wondering why don't we have more reefs closer to the shore? Uh, great question. The Army Corps of Engineers and the Florida Department of Environmental Protection, um, they developed a map of zones with GPS coordinates that um, allow for artificial reefs to be deployed at certain depths based off of sand patterns, littoral drift, blah, 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 blah. The, generally, the approved zone is three quarters of a mile out, 40 feet deep. There's deeper zones, which we have not deployed in 70 and 100 feet deep. That's where the ships go that they sink, which is trash and land, not a great idea, but whatever. Um, City of Hollywood agrees with you, and I started working with City of Hollywood many years ago. The permitting to change the zone, it was like a three year fight, we started it before COVID. We did get the permit. The City of Hollywood did make an RFP, request for proposal, we did win the request for proposal. They did approve it. We will have near shore shallow reefs in Hollywood. But I'm going to be honest with you. Do you know the best? Do you know the best time to plant a tree? Years ago. That's the second best time. <laughs> the best time to plant a tree was, was yesterday. The second best time was 30 years ago. We're planting underwater forests to be adjacent to the natural forest that's diving. And one of the only things that we could really do and guarantee is we're gonna take pressure off the natural reef, allowing time for it to heal by planting this adjacent artificial forest next to it. It, from, and I, once again, I'm not a marine biologist, but it apparently, scientifically, it, the near shore reefs are more for tourism and diving. They have some environmental benefit, but there's a lot of concern that the sand's gonna choke them out because um, the sand's gonna ultimately wash up. And they're too, they're too shallow, so it's so hot yeah. for them. So that's why you're we're getting bleaching because the shallower reefs are getting bleached out. So. We are. It is going to happen in Hollywood probably by 2025.